Right. The paper is about um, uh, climate sensitivity and uh, uh, return predictability in stock markets. Well, the idea is that well, climate change uh, may affect everybody. Right. It may affect everybody in the society. Right. Well, uh, the existing papers in climate finance mainly fo focus on uh, physical uh, risks and damages caused by climate events, events like natural disasters. Um, for for well, the impact of that for firms uh, located on the coastal locations, flooding areas, uh, and the effects may be uh, stronger for certain certain industries, carbon intensive industries, uh, food agriculture, right? Uh, but actually, cl climate change, if it affects the whole society, it may affect how consumers uh, spend their money, and this may in turn uh, affect all the firms' profits and the stock prices at the end, right? And if that does, uh, if climate change does matter for the society, for our economy, and then their cost and benefit needs to be understood uh, much more carefully, because certain firms may be uh, hurt by these climate changes, temperature changes, where, where other firms in the economy may benefit. Right? So how uh, stock prices can take all these uh, um, uh, well, uh, impact into account, well, that's going to be studied in, in, in our paper. So we uh, proposed a new measure um, on a uh, so firm level measure of climate risks. So we use stock market data trying to measure um, basically a firm's stock price sensitivity to, um, to climate changes. So I'll go to details of this matter. So first, uh, just to get some uh, like news, uh, news articles uh, from BBC, right? So this, uh, well, this news talk about uh, hot weather, right? We just have had very hot weather uh, in, in Europe, very hot summer, and then people are getting crazy uh, across Europe, right? But a few months ago, actually, people, uh, there were very cold winters in, uh, in Europe and the rest of the world. Many countries experienced some of the, uh, uh, the coldest weathers uh, for 50 years, right? So we do see these climate changes, uh, they uh, changed our temperature. They may lead to very hot summer and very a very cold winter, so in general, the weather can be more volatile. But some firms may benefit from that. For example, the, the, the news from the, from the left uh, shows that well, actually retail uh, prices, retail sales in the UK went up when the weather is becoming very hot. It's because uh, people go shopping, they, they buy new clothes, uh, they buy food, uh, they spend money, and they try to enjoy this, themselves in, in the summer, right? Um, but some other, other industries may, may, or firms may, may be hurt, right? Some, uh, these are some news from the right, saying that some, some uh, SSE, that's um, a basic utility firm in the UK, uh, the profit got hurt because, well, their, their asset got damaged uh, by, by climate changes because they're wind turbines uh, doesn't work very well if there is no wind. So um, given that we all, uh, sort of um, know that climate change indeed is important for, for finance, so we try to contribute a bit um, on, the, on the impact of uh, the systematic impact of climate changes uh, at the firm level. So however, uh, if we look at current literature, there is no um, so systematic risk measure of climate risk in, in financial market. So most of the measures uh, are based on sort of carbon emissions, um, assets, sort of carbon intensity or the location of the firms, whether that's in a risky area or not. Right. So um, we use them, uh, the measure we are proposing is uh, using the stock, stock prices data. Right. So the idea is very simple. Right. So if you think about how a stock market price uh, cash flows are produced by firms, I guess the fundamental model we have, we have in mind is capital asset pricing model, where the systematic risk of a firm, which is a long-run driver of returns for, for, for assets um, in, in capital markets, uh, that's measured by the sensitivity of stock returns to stock index movement. Right? And then what we are thinking is that, uh, well, uh, how about um, having a measure of sensitivity of stock returns to abnormal temperature changes, right? So if temperature changes a lot, very hot, very cold in certain bounces, well, stock returns of some firms may change, right? So certain firms, uh, if uh, uh, certain firms, their, their stock returns are more influenced uh, by these abnormal temperature changes, and then we can say, well, these firms are more sensitive uh, to climate change, and then uh, they are uh, uh, defined as firms of high climate risk uh, in, our, um, in our study, right? 
uh, whereas for other firms, if their stock returns are less correlated uh, with temperature changes, so these firms we define as uh, firms have low climate, climate uh, risk in our, in our sample. Right? And then uh, after deriving this, uh, this matter, uh, we basically see how this matter of climate risk is priced uh, in stock prices, in stock markets. Uh, we run uh, some uh, several tests uh, trying to uh, see whether investors fully understand or price this information uh, in stock prices. We're also going to study if this uh, matter of climate risks uh, relates to the, futures, uh, to the future firm profits. So our, our finding is that um, based on this um, uh, matter of climate risks, we found that firms with high climate risks, basically high uh, sensitivity, stock return sensitivity to temperature changes, they underperform uh, in the long run. So we gather uh, US data for all firms in the uh, listed market in the, in the US uh, for more than 85 years. So from 1931 to uh, 2017. So based on this relatively long period of 85 years, we found that high climate uh, sensitivity stocks underperformed the market uh, by 3.6% uh, uh, per year. And also these, uh, uh, these stocks also have a lower uh, profits in the future. So this implies that climate risk does matter for, for profits, it matters for stock prices, but investors do not fully understand uh, the impact of climate risks. That's for that leaves predictability of stock returns uh, on the market. So in terms of contribution to the literature, already uh, this session uh, is on climate risk, so uh, most of the, a lot of uh, discussion on literature already. I guess our, our main uh, contribution is to have this firm level market-based uh, uh, matter of climate uh, risks, which is uh, first uh, in, the, in the literature. Well, um, our data on, on climate uh, is from NOAA, which is uh, basically, um, uh, which reports the temperature data uh, for the United States. Um, and our key matter of temperature is temperature anomaly, so which is abnormal temperature changes. So basically every month they report temperature and compare this temperature, this com temperature is compared uh, to previous temperature in the same month over the last 30 years. Right? So then this, this, basically this measure tells us uh, well, whether it's too cold or too hot this month compared to historical temperatures. And then we uh, collect data from other standard uh, data sources uh, uh, using CRISP and CompuStat for stock returns and, and uh, uh, accounting data. And our sample period is from uh, 1930s to, 2003, uh, to 2013. So let me just spend a few, a couple minutes on uh, our key uh, so matter of uh, climate risks. Right? So we basically uh, run a rolling window regression. Right? For each month, we look at past three years data for each stock. So past 36 months, we run a, a simple factor model so we run the returns of, the, of each company on uh, the past, on, on the stock index returns uh, and another factor, so that's a, a second factor, that's temperature anomaly, right? So there is a theta uh, in front of the, um, let me see, there that's one, yeah. So this coefficient in front of a temperature anomaly that matters the return sensitivity to temperature changes. So a positive theta means that the returns of your stocks tend to move in the same direction with abnormal temperature changes. So if temperature goes up, your return goes up. If temperature goes down, return goes down. Right? And then the negative theta would mean that returns of your company goes, tends to go in opposite direction with temperatures. So when in very hot weather, you, your uh, stock returns tend to suffer, or in very cold winter, your returns going up. So of course we don't have a prior on uh, what kind of uh, the direction of, of uh, theta that, uh, because firms may benefit from very low, very um, hot weather and very cold weather at the same time. For example, for clothing firms, if you sell clothes, uh, well, if uh, it's very hot summer, people go go buy uh, new new clothes. But if winter, if it's a very cold winter, uh, well, they, they, people also need to buy new clothes, right? because they don't have enough uh, stock in their, in their wardrobe. And so that's why we take uh, absolute value of this matter, right? So that's our key matter of climate sensitivity. So basically, um, this theta C, uh, that tells us 
basically uh, um, how sensitive your stock re uh, return is to abnormal temperature changes, no matter it's positive changes or negative changes. So basically, every month we run this rolling window regression for 85 years. So we have uh, this uh, theta measure, that's well, our climate risk measure, right? And then the next step is to construct portfolios based on these measures. So we source stocks uh, based on uh, climate risks. So uh, the top 20 percentile, that's the stocks uh, who, which are basically have the highest uh, uh, climate risks. And the low uh, portfolio, would be the lowest 20 percentile of stocks, basically that are insensitive to temperature changes after we control for uh, market movement, et cetera. And the remaining stocks are in the middle. So we, we, we have tried different ways to define these sort of different cutoffs of portfolios, uh, have bigger or, uh, or smaller cutoffs uh, for the high and the low portfolios, but results are uh, very much similar. Okay, so uh, some data. So this is a raw data we downloaded from NOAA, so the national uh, um, sort of agency in the US, it reports uh, temperatures. Well, so you have seen this in, in other uh, um, presentations in the same session. So basically this uh, graph tells us the temperature changes from 1930s uh, to, um, to 2017. So these are temperature anomaly. So basically this is uh, temperature of each bounce compared to historical temperature for the same month. So basically controlling for seasonality. So as you have seen, temperature has been more or less stable, right, until 1975, whereas things so start, uh, well, it's going to move up a little bit. Uh, so f uh, over the last uh, 30, 40 years, right. Another thing you can see is that actually a temperature can be quite volatile, right? So you could, uh, so it's not just uh, uh, increase, increase over time, but you can see a lot of volatility of a temperature for uh, in each month. So here is uh, just um, uh, basically, uh, we just try to see uh, which industries uh, tend to have this uh, highest climate risks based on our measure. So what we did in this, um, in this um, table is simply ca first calculate temperature, uh, sort of uh, the theta, the climate risk for each firm, right? And then we aggregate them to the pharma, uh, pharma uh, French 48 industries, right? And then um, we, uh, so uh, we report the top 10 and bottom, uh, top 10, bottom 10 industries of unconditional climate risks. So that's before we take in the absolute value, right? So uh, here, uh, the column on the left shows that the industries with the highest uh, climate uh, risks. So remember here, high, highest temp, um, unconditional climate risks, meaning that these stocks in these industries, the, the stock resistance tend to go up in very, very hot weather. Right? So which uh, industries benefit from very hot weather? Well, it seems uh, medical equipments uh, drugs uh, up there, it seems uh, in very hot weather, indeed, consumers need more medical help, right? And similarly, some industries like toys, fun, so entertainment industries also benefit from very hot weather. So on the column uh, to the right, so these are the bottom 10 industries if you, do, if you run the unconditional version of uh, climate risks. So remember, uh, if when we run this unconditional version of uh, climate risks, so the most negative uh, numbers, meaning that stock, uh, these stocks benefit most if weather is very cold, right? So in very cold winter. Right? So which industries benefit from very cold winter? Well, unsurprisingly, you see oil and coal uh, benefits from very cold weather because people need more heating. And um, uh, you also see food and smoke industries uh, where the returns tend to, stock returns tend to go up if uh, uh, we experience very cold weather. So basically meaning that people eat more and smoke more in very cold weather. And then we use this, uh, we, we take the absolute value of the unconditional climate risks to get our conditional version of climate risks because we don't care whether uh, you benefit from very hot or very cold weather. What we care is if temperature, if climate changes, temperatures become very volatile, so we want to see which firms 
are most sensitive to these abnormal temperature changes. So we uh, divide the universe of crisp uh, um, stocks uh, into five portfolios. So here are just some summary statistics. Oh, uh, I think click wrong, wrong button. The low portfolio have the um, lowest climate risk <laughs> about 0.1. The high portfolio have an average of 1.6 um, uh, climate risk uh, CETA measure. You also see that um, unsurprisingly, I guess the high um, climate risk portfolio also have slightly uh, smaller size. Otherwise, they're pretty much similar across portfolios. OK. So here is just some simple uh, statistics on the returns. Right? So without doing complicated um, analysis on returns, first we just see, want to see what's excess returns, so returns of stocks uh, in excess of the risk interest rate, uh, interest rate, right? And then to the right, we also calculate the uh, risk-adjusted returns, sorry, uh, characteristic-adjusted returns. So basically, these are DGTW-adjusted returns, meaning that we compare each stock to a similar stock of similar size, similar book-to-market, similar past returns, right? So basically, you uh, control for very similar uh, stocks, and then what is the additional return you are getting uh, from your portfolio? Right? So from here, you can already see that uh, stocks of the highest um, climate risks have negative returns, right? So basically, if you, uh, and the return is decreasing with uh, climate risks. Of course, in this um, particular table, we have a shorter uh, time period. It's from the 1960s onwards, because we don't have a characteristic data for the first 50 years. So next, we just use a full sample, full 85, 86 year sample uh, to run the factor model, right? And then we, we are interested in, in the alpha, right? A positive alpha, uh, so it would mean that your stock outperform uh, the factors, right? A negative alpha, meaning that you have a lower adjusted risk adjusted returns. So if you uh, look at the first row, uh, you see, uh, here it reports alpha from the low portfolio, low climate risk portfolio, uh, to the uh, high, uh, the portfolio with the highest climate risks. So you see returns or alphas tend to go down uh, when climate risks are higher. Right? So if you take the difference between low and high, so low minus high, so that's a trading strategy of go long in low climate risk portfolios and go short on high climate risk portfolios, you have uh, a positive alpha of about 0.28. Um, percent a month, so which, are, which is about 3% uh, a year for the past eight, uh, 85 years. So here is a simple model based on um, the four-factor model. So we run a, sim a similar regression for six-factor and seven-factor models, so controlling for uh, the return reversals within the last months, within the five, five years, also control for the liquidity of, of stocks, and re, uh, the results are more or less similar. So the long short portfolio generate an alpha of um, about 3% a year, 2 to 3% a year. Of course, if you include the liquidity factor, we have a shorter sample period, oh, sorry, uh, because the liquidity factor is only available uh, from 1960s, 70s. So, of course, we can argue that the beta may change over time. Portfolio manager, managers may adjust their beta portfolios based on macroeconomic conditions. So then we run a conditional version of our model. Basically, beta can change according to macroeconomic environment. For example, a recession, whether the consumption, whether that's high or low, the dividend use, the term spread, um, and uh, basically term, spread, uh, term structure of interest rate, et cetera. Right? But what you see is that uh, the alpha is pretty much similar uh, to the, uh, basically results are very robust uh, relative to the uh, time varying betas. And then we run some cross-sectional tests, basically run pharma Macbeth regression. So every month we run a cross-sectional regression and take an average across the party uh, for, uh, of all the months in, uh, over the past um, 85 years. And you get pretty much the similar uh, message from this regression, basically high uh, climate risk firms, they underperform 
uh, in the long run, right? And a particular interesting aspect of this regression is that we include industry fixed effects. So basically, we can, uh, control for the impact, impact that climate risk may be different across industries. So even for the same industry, firms with high climate risks, they underperform other firms in the same industry over the long term. Right, so till now, all the tests are based on stock returns, right? So then you probably ask the question whether that's just something strange happening in stock markets uh, where it has nothing to do with the real performance of the firm. Uh, well, to check that, we also see, <clears throat> investigate whether uh, climate risks re indeed relate to the profits in the future for each firm. So we find that a high climate risk also leads to lower uh, profits for a firm measured by return on assets. So the impact is about 2% uh, a year, meaning that the ROA for high climate risk firms in the long term is 2% uh, lower than other firms within the same industry. Right, so is this some missing risk factor uh, or some so short-term mispricing? Well, to check that, although we have included a number of uh, risk factors uh, in our test, we also done a longevity test to see whether our uh, predictability in alpha persists over time. So what we did is we increased the lag between the portfolio uh, formation and the return calculation. So we see that when we increase uh, the, the lag, the alpha disappears, meaning that there are some short-term mispricing uh, in the in stock market. Where this can be corrected uh, in the longer term. But another robustness test, a test we are doing is that maybe there are some asymmetric climate risks. So certain firms are very sensitive to very hot weather, but they, they're not sensitive at all to cold winters. Right? Whereas other firms may, may be other way around. So they may be very sensitive to very cold weather, but very hot uh, weather doesn't affect their profits and returns. Right? So to investigate this possibility, we run a similar model, but we include two temperature anomalies. One is for positive, one, the other one is for negative. So basically, we uh, allow for different uh, slope, different sensitivity to very hot temperature and very uh, low temperature. And the results are very similar. So basically, the predictability we find is present in both, uh, in both cases, although uh, the alpha is strong, uh, slightly larger for positive temperature anomaly, meaning that when temperature getting hotter, we see more uh, underreaction in the market, or meaning that there is more alpha uh, in, the, in stock prices. So to conclude, uh, based on past uh, 85 years data, we find uh, we develop a measure of climate risk uh, purely using uh, the correlation between stock prices and temperature changes, right? And then based on this market-based measure of climate risks, um, we find that these firms, they tend to underperform uh, other firms with low, low uh, temperature uh, sensitivity. Uh, these firms also have a lower profits in the future. So um, what's the reason for that? Uh, so we think it's just a climate changes uh, leads to these temperature changes uh, in the long term, uh, but investors are a bit slow in updating their, their trading and updating their, uh, their actions. So therefore, this leads to uh, alpha uh, left on the table. 